You made your first documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, at age 47, which is a little bit later in life uh, than, than most people um, in terms of embarking on this career journey. What inspired that first step into a very different, very different field for you? Well, I, you know, I, I came from a film family. Um, I, so I, I ran from that as a young person. And you know, I, I wanted to make my own life and my own name and be my own person, really. Um, and that led me to a series of relationships to nonprofits and issues and, you know, kind of down the path of what is involved in women's leadership and why would it make a difference and why would it matter. It was that that led me to Liberia and the, and the story that the film is based on. So I came to filmmaking through this totally different path, which was as an activist who needed to say something. Um, but once, so I was afraid. Believe me, I was afraid because <laughs> I felt like I could only fail, you know. But um, especially starting that old. <laughs> Why did you feel that you could only fail if you tried this this venture? Well, you know, my last name kind of hovers over a lot of the things that I do, and it's a great tool for a lot of things. Um, but it can also, you know, it, it enters the room before you do everywhere you go. So it, it felt a little like. Um, if I did one thing wrong, it would be magnified. Describe that experience for you and your relationship with, with your name in your, in your early years. Well, in my early years, it generally involved um, wearing really ratty clothes from the used clothing store and um, getting out of cabs six blocks before where I was going so nobody would see I was a rich girl taking a cab. <laughs> um, so a lot of silliness um, and a lot of evading and a certain amount of lying um, to people and saying I wasn't related. It just felt embarrassing. Why? Um, it, <laughs> it's just so much bigger than I was. Um, and, and frankly, you know, very pop culture and I was, you know, going to be a smart kid at Yale and so I wanted to read Sartre and, and, and there was Walt Disney <laughs> ruining my intellectualness um, in people's eyes. So, so, you know, no matter, it was uncool. <laughs> it was uncool and unmanageable for me. Did you take on a new relationship to your last name when you embarked on the very industry that your last name exemplified and that you <laughs> ran from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, um, both for good and bad. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember sitting with the audience um, at Tribeca, which is our first really big public audience that we hadn't hand chosen ourselves, and, and feeling the audience laugh when they needed to laugh and cry when they needed to cry. That's an incredible feeling for a filmmaker. And um, the film has this kind of upward trajectory and you really get left in a good place after a lot of trials. And um, I realized for the first time as I was watching it with the audience, we'd made a Disney movie. And <laughs> I elbowed my partner and said, oh my god, did we really do that? So, so that was kind of funny. I, I, I started to be able to own it in ways I never had allowed myself to do before. Um, and honestly, I've started to feel like it's not unrealistic to think that I can, I can give it my own spin. I, it doesn't feel in control of me anymore. What surprised you about yourself during that, that first filmmaking process? Uh, pretty much everything. <laughs> um, I, I, I had up till then mostly done sort of um, I got my PhD, which is supposed to certify you. It's supposed to make you feel like you could do anything, and it, and it kind of didn't. Um, and then I stayed home with my kids, and then I went on a lot of boards and did a lot of fundraising. And what it all amounted to was I felt like I didn't have any skills, which wasn't true at all. Um, I had built a million skills, but I just didn't feel like I had a resume that would impress anyone. It doesn't matter what you went to school to do or, or what you're certified to do. You, you have any number of skills that you've built over a lifetime, especially home with kids and doing lots of things and responding to life well and being open to learning all the way. So um, a producer is sort of a, a person who just figures stuff out. And uh, so I knew it. You've been giving the voice to or, or, or the platform to showcase the stories of these incredible women who are bringing peace and, and change agents or in the midst of, of significant conflict. When you have, have spent time with these women on the ground through your work, what's been the, the greatest learning lesson for mm -hmm. you as a storyteller and as a voice for them? You know, there is a certain personality that I find in every single place I go, 
whether there's been war for a long time or peace, um, of the certain kind of woman who steps up. And not every woman steps up either. Um, there's a certain kind of woman who always pushes her sleeves up and, and does something and um, takes responsibility. And I've been so struck, not just in, in war settings, but when I go, say, to site visits for community-based organizations, I work with the Global Fund for Women looking at grant making, too. And, um, and, and they tend to share certain qualities. They, they are always funny. They are just always funny. And they always feed you. And they're, um, they're the ones who were really close to their fathers, almost always. Um, feisty and... Um, and if we recognize that and build on that strength that's already there, you know, what could we accomplish that now with, with resources and access that we never had before? You've obviously created this extraordinary career as a filmmaker, but it took you, as you said, a long time to find this higher calling, uh, struggling a lot with your personal identity, with a last name that is iconic and, and legendary. I remember being in Disney World and standing on that, this mound of dirt, which is where the castle is. And I remember watching my grandfather, Roy, uh, who was Wells' brother, you know, build that place and, and then open it in 1971. And then two months to the day later, dying very suddenly of a stroke. And my grandmother always said, that place killed and that place killed. So many years later, I drive, you know, in the rented car through Orlando to Disney World, and you know, what had been Orange Groves was a thriving city, a thriving city. And, and, I, and I started, what I started to have was something new, which was pride. There are no lines you have to color inside of, and there's no rule book, and you know, you can start a whole other career at 47 if you want. Um, and you don't have to go to an Ivy League school to be smart, and you don't have to be, you know, a lawyer to be important. There are a million, billion lives out there to be lived, and yours is unique to you. 